Hello everyone and welcome to the Priceless Podcast. My name is Michael Sechen. This podcast is made in partnership with the European Forum of LGBT Christian Groups. Subscribe, like, share this video and after you've seen it you can check out the links in the podcast description. Today we have a new guest and he comes from uh, the UK and his name is Paul Whiting. Hello Paul and welcome to the Priceless Podcast. Hello, good to be there. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you accepted to be uh, my guest. Paul also uh, wrote a book uh, and I will share the link in the podcast description so you can check it out. But of course, your story has a lot of updates. But be before we get into your story, I would like to say a few words, like I'm just going to say one word to get to know you a little bit better and you can say whatever comes to your mind when you hear the word. Are you up for it? Okay. Yes. So the first word is uh, identity. Mixed. Uh, sexuality. Certain. Faith. Volatile. Preaching. I used to love it a lot. Uh, church. Conflicted. Music. Passion. Gay culture. It's who I am. Thank you. <laughs> so this was it. I actually uh, like to use these words to kind of shorten down getting to know you a little bit. So you already gave a few glimpses, but let's go uh, deeper into who you are. So Tell us a little bit about your story of growing up and your process of discovering your sexuality. I was born and raised in the Pentecostal church. I was aware of my difference since I was three years old and grew up with that, that silence around difference for many years until I got into my teens and began to explore in a very um, non-active way, like buying pornography and sneaking off to shows in London. But I was the blue-eyed boy in church, you know. I was the person my, both my father and my local church wanted to go into ministry, and I certainly have a strong sense of call to ministry since I was about 16. But in the same time, I was old enough to really start to explore the other side of me. There wasn't really a conflict, but there was a conflict. I mean, the, the conflict wasn't with God. The conflict was with silence that nobody else seemed to identify, not, not within the church context. But I uh, got a place in seminary went off to train to be a pastor, and I think that's when everything began to explode. <laughs> um, but I got appointed to a church in Tottenham, 19, 1978. It's like a, two lifetimes ago, and made connections with the um, what was then the gay Christian movement. It later became the lesbian and gay Christian movement, and uh, in a way became somewhat actively involved. And that's when the conflict began, because I thought, well, maybe I should join an ex-gay movement instead. I, I did contact a group called Free, True Freedom Trust, but after several conversations, they said I was too gay for their organization. So I, I think I had this dream that maybe the church I was in could be a catalyst for you know a more diverse congregation. I mean, it was very naive, but there was a number of people, a number of queer people starting to attend the church because I'd become known within LGCM circles. But inevitably, you know, as they say crudely, the shit hit the fan. I couldn't live in this double life. And uh, eventually my roommate reported me to the church authorities and I was asked to resign or they kicked me out. And that's where my journey really began. That freed me up to get involved in gay Christian activism. I joined the gay Christian movement 
I was on the nat national executive, and from there I became the international liaison, and from there became one of the founding board members of the European Forum. That really was the motivation for a life change. I did an exploration or a discernment probably to be an Anglican priest, but again they said I was too gay. So I eventually joined Metropolitan Community Church. And for the time that I was in England in the in the early nineties, I worked with MCC and with the European Forum. Um, then in ninety five I immigrated to the USA to work full time with Metropolitan Community Church. I was there twenty seven years until last year. Yes. I actually wanted to ask you, I mean, I read your book. For the viewers and listeners that haven't read your book, you actually very openly talk about all the hardships that you're going through. What you just mentioned, your own, your roommate, as much as I remember, he was also a friend, a very good friend of yours. And yeah. he actually reported you to the church authorities and you lost your job. Uh, I, I mean, we could say that you were exonerated <laughs> from, uh, from what you were doing. And all that fighting with church and with the people who say God is love, how did you manage to keep your faith within all of these hardships? Because reading your book, if someone reads your book, it's kind of like you're going from place to place and then it seems like it's getting better and then something happens and then it seems it's getting better and then something else happens and still you kept your faith. How did you make this work? Because my faith was in God and not in the church. My father said something to me when we were still in relationship many years ago and he was a very devout man. He was Pentecostal, but he was initially an elder in the church. And he said, always put your trust in Jesus, not in people. Because he said, ultimately, people, even himself, would let me down. And I think that was quite profound, because I've always had my faith in God. I mean, I've loved the church. I've loved the people in the church. But my faith has never been in the church because it's pretty unreliable. <laughs> and so I think that's a sustaining thing. Every aspect of life that I've gone through, I've seen God in a different aspect. There was an interesting occasion. It would have been 1984, 85, just as the AIDS crisis had started. And I was really exploring a way for church. And uh, I was standing at a bus stop. And somebody walked down the opposite side of the street who I used to know very well. And there was just a nodding acknowledgement with them. And I thought, whoa, that's like my relationship with Christ. We used to know each other well, so I thought. But now we sort of have a, have a nodding acquaintance. But we still acknowledge each other. So how did you reconcile your sexuality with your faith and vice versa? Never really had a problem. I've always felt accepted by God. I think joining the lesbian and gay Christian movement, they, their, their aims, their vision statement, which I can't recall now, but really embodied it. But for the first time, I ascribed to something that really embodied the fact that, you know, I was a gift of God. And as I've gone through life, I've recognized even more so right at the beginning, I was a gift from God, that I was always called. I was just in the wrong place to begin with. But my early years in formation was as much a part of my calling in the latter years than the things I've done in, you know, within the LGBT community. I've never had a crisis over, you know, biblical condemnation because I've always felt good about it. I've, without getting into theology, for a long time I believed 
that sin is anything that separates you from God. And I've never felt my sexuality has separated me from God. I've always learned that, you know, if you can't take God with you, then maybe you don't need to go there. But being an adventurer and being bold, I've always taken God with me, you know, whether it's been to a sauna, whether it's been to a club, whether it's, you know, been to a strange city. Um, and so I've never had that sense of condemnation. So you talked a little bit about your faith and how you never lost your faith. But at the same time, there were quite a few challenges for you to be and stay a pastor. On one hand, what were the greatest challenges for you to be gay and a pastor? And on the other hand, what kept you going to pursue being a pastor? My love of ministry has always been my greatest love. Just ask my long-term partners, of which I've had two, and they'll always say, you know, ministry came first, which I sort of regret now, but, you know, it's about passion. I think I've always had a passion for people. I think my love of religion has changed. I mean, I was born into it. And I've really had to liberate, liberate myself from it without losing my faith. It's like each challenge has brought a new awareness that needs liberating. Because I've always loved being part of liberating people in their journey. That's why I joined LGCM. That's why I joined the European Forum. That's why I've worked with Metropolitan Community Church. Not because of the specific organization, but because of the work that they do with people. Tell me a little bit about your family and your relationship to your family, if you're willing to talk about that. My parents uh, divorced when I was in my teens, when I was still in school. I came out to my mother when I was doing my internship with the Assemblies of God. She was just surprised, never crossed her mind. and. To this day, she always regrets the grandchildren that never happened. And it's interesting now, my mother is just about to turn 90. And she only wants to talk about those pre-coming out days, when we were a family, before the, the divorce, when we were all together. She has no interest in talking about my ministry or my sexuality. My father, I thought, would be far more difficult in one sense, 1978, we started an organization called the Evangelical Fellowship, which was really an affirming group for evangelical gays and lesbians. And it was in the founding meeting was in Wellingboro, which is the town that I was born. And so I went to visit my father, thinking I should at least do that. And to my surprise, he said, I know why you're here. He said, It's in the local newspaper. That began a conversation that took me by surprise that he actually had known. But his closing words were, don't be gay on my doorstep. So I never went back. And he, had, he was in the process of divorce and remarriage. And so his life changed quite dramatically. Um, I know years later, we met up. I mean, we were really estranged for the next 14 years, but we met up occasionally. and. He had worse treatment from the church because of his divorce and remarriage than I had for being gay. We, we had a deathbed reunion, which was very Hollywood-esque. But... Would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, how your reunion okay. went? Um, we'd just not had much contact. I mean, I'd been in contact with my mother through this time, but not my father. And Good Friday, 1992, my brother called me to say he'd had a stroke. My father had a stroke. So I was working with Metropolitan Community Church in Manchester at the time. So a member of the church took me down to the hospital to visit him. And uh, when I walked in, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. He was just totally shocked. Um, but he'd recovered enough to to speak. 
And so, you know, he said, why have you come? I said, well, I came to pray in case nobody else wanted to. And uh, we began to talk. And then my friend went off with his wife for coffee. He said, you know, over the years, because of my situation, my perspective has changed. And then he became obsessed with the fact that the guy that brought me down was my boyfriend. And I could not convince him otherwise. He said, it's okay, you don't have to hide it from me. I said, he's not my boyfriend, he's just a friend. But anyway, I, after about two hours conversation, I prayed for him. And he kissed me on the lips, and I can never remember an occasion when he did that. Then his wife came back with my friend and said, oh, maybe God has caused this to happen so we can, you know, have a relationship again. And I thought, oh, God, I hope not. I spent 14 years getting out of this relationship, but he had a second stroke and died nine weeks later. So I was saved from having to work through that one. So one, when you think back to that moment and what you said, the kiss that he gave you, what did that mean for you? I don't know. I've actually never really thought about that. Um, it was just, it was a shock. I guess it was a sense of affirmation. He'd always said that he prayed for me every day. So I've never had a sense of he didn't love me. He just couldn't accept me because of his religious beliefs. And when his religious beliefs rejected him as well, I think there was some sort of realization. You know, I would have loved to have spent the last 30 years talking to him. And I think if I have a regret, it's we never had, we've never had the opportunity to talk about how things were and how things are. But, you know, you have to accept that and move on. And so many people have this strong love for their family. I don't have the strong love. I mean, I moved back to the UK for my mother's health, but it was because my sister needed me to do so, and I was in a position to do so. But I'm not sentimental about family. They're right-wing, racist, and homophobic. So tell us a little bit about your uh, book. I think I'm trying to remember now because it, it, it is a few weeks when I uh, finished reading it. But you're ending kind of with your, uh, when you started for MCC. Is that right? No, it's, it ends when I started with MCC in America. It's really yes. my life up until moving to America. Yes. And, so tell um, us a little bit and, how that was your life in America. You mean my life since the book? Yes. Let me say, I wrote the book as therapy, really to do some healing from the past. And I moved to America really because of a lack of opportunity, as I thought, to do progressive ministry in the UK. And there was certainly no full-time ministry opportunity in MCC in the UK. We were also in the middle of an AIDS crisis, and I was severely burned out. In the year before I emigrated, eight of my friends died. And then my dog died, and suddenly the dog became the catalyst for all the grief. I needed a change. I'd been working with MCC for four years. I started their church in Manchester. So really got the passion for doing ministry again. And the only place really to do it that I could see that was progressive and radical was to go and work with MCC in the US. And so that's really how the journey began. Um, I'd been in 93 and been very inspired by one or two connections. Um, but initially, my plan was to bring some of those great ideas back to the UK and see if they would work here. But they just didn't. It's just a very different church culture. And I think MCC in America appealed much more to my evangelical style roots than what was available in, in the UK. So I um, applied for a church, went to Des Moines, Iowa. I had no idea where Des Moines was. I thought it was in Louisiana because it sounded French. They gave me a full-time salary of $9,000 a year 
plus a house. And I thought that was spectacular. And I spent, ironically, I spent those first two years almost being an AIDS chaplain. Des Moines was a city where gay men were coming back to die. They'd moved out. It's like this huge farming state. They'd moved out to San Francisco, Chicago, New York when they were in their teens, and now they were coming back to die. I think the greatest honor I've ever had in my life, the local gay bar used to keep my number behind the bar in case anybody needed support. And I was only in Des Moines for three years, and it wasn't an easy three years because the orientation was really challenging. You think, you know, well, Britain and America, two countries the same. Um, but actually, culturally, they're vastly different. They're linguistically different to some extent. And so the first three years was this combination of really supporting people who were dying and having an orientation to life in America. In the opening chapter of the book, I just found it shocking because the Americans tell history in a different way. I, I remember being stunned by the fact that the Americans claim they won World War Two, And I'm thinking, well, Churchill won World War Two, And just the perspective on history was so very different. But I found a sense of diversity and inclusiveness that I couldn't find here then and I can't find here now. I think for all of the political and religious challenges in America, there is a real sense of diversity that comes out of, I think, comes out of the civil rights movements there. A, f a funny thing happened. Um, my first year, my local church hosted the MCC district conference, like a regional event. And because I was the new kid on the block, I was invited to preach at the last, the closing worship. And we were told to wear a stole of our, that was a favorite. So a friend of mine who had died the year before in Britain had a, um, a stole made of bandanas. So I wore that. Halfway through, one congregation got up and walked out. And I was accused of wearing a bandana of back pocket handkerchiefs, and somebody said I could have just have worn a dildo around my neck, and I'm thinking, what? What have I come to? So, you know, I had several conversations and moved through that, but that was reported, and when I went forward for the affirmation of my ordination, this was raised, that I'd caused scandal in the, in the conference, and it was suggested to me that if I wanted to stay in America, I should find a husband quickly. So I did. That very conference, I met somebody and was with him for nine years. But he was uh, he was from Alabama and um, a very Southern belle. He hated Des Moines. He came to live there. And so I promised his mother I would take him home, at least to the South. So that was a catalyst, really, from going from Des Moines and working in Florida. And I think I've sort of always had a sense in ministry to go where I'm needed. I mean, I look back now with some regret that maybe if I'd have stayed a long time in a place, yeah, I could have been a celebrity, could have had a big church. But somebody said to me just before I moved back, you have to put that into context. In the six churches I've worked with in my career, I've touched hundreds of hundreds of lives, which could be just as impactful if 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 I'd have stayed in one place and had a bigger congregation. I mean, I, if it were not for COVID and my mother's situation, I would still be doing ministry in America now because there is just a freedom in worship. There's a freedom in diversity that I really struggle to find in churches in Europe. Tell me a little bit, I mean, we are close to the International Day AIDS Day, and I would like to hear from you, what did this do to you? You said that when you came to Des Moines that you were actually 
a minister for all the people that died, that were dying and died of AIDS. What did that do to you? How was it for you doing ministry in this time? Let's backtrack a bit because that needs to have some context. I, I came out to the whole world in 1981, just as AIDS was being recognized in America. I moved back to London in 1984 after being sent away by the Pentecostals for some conversion therapy, which didn't work. Actually, when I, the, the British TV series, It's a Sin, when I watched it, I thought that was my life on film. I was just back there in London at the beginnings of the AIDS crisis, and I had a lot of survivor guilt in the decade that followed because I survived and all the people in the community that I knew, a lot of them had died. And I just felt like I didn't do enough. And I moved because I was burned out. And the last thing I expected in going to America is to land right in the middle of it again. But the difference was the people I worked with in Des Moines were not my friends. They were my parish, my congregants, people I never got a chance to know, but um, they're people who I helped on their journey in the last few weeks of their life. So in, a, in many ways, it was a blessing. You know, I, I got to know people, many of whom had religious backgrounds and had left that behind. And in coming back to Des Moines, I also got to work with their families and to do real justice work with them. You know, for some of the families, they didn't even know their sons were gay until they came home with AIDS. I, I think, for me, that was the most profound way to restart ministry. Were you scared at all? I mean, back then there was a lot of misinformation about AIDS and what it means. It was seen as the gay plague, like, for you personally. No, no. I think back in the beginning, there was this whole sense of denial. It's not going to affect me. And I think when my first friend died of AIDS or just disappeared from the scene, there was some concern. But, I, but pretty early on, when I moved to Manchester and dated somebody seriously, I said, you know, we need to get tested. And, you know, that's always been important in my life. You know, you can't fear being tested. You can maybe fear the outcome. It's always been important for me to, to face the truth. If you face the truth, then you can get the support to get through it. If you deny the truth, then you're going to live, you're going to be paranoid for the rest of your life. So looking back at your life and everything you did, what is the most exciting thing that you're really glad you did or decided to do? I don't think there's a most exciting thing. I think my first visit to the European Forum as a pretty provincial, small town Pentecostal was extremely exciting. That was in 1984. But going to America a decade later was equally exciting. But I'm an adventurer. Once I'd been to the forum and then being on the board, you know, go to all these board meetings around Europe, I suddenly got this taste for adventure and doing an adventure by myself. Years later, when I was in a long-term relationship, my husband and I traveled all around the Caribbean and did lots of vacations together. That was really good for that time of life. But it lost the sense of being a lone adventurer. I just have been really excited about going to places and finding new communities. I've never been a homebody. As, as a kid, I always wanted to be a missionary. I just didn't think at the time it would have this, it would work out this way. You just mentioned your husband. 
would you like to talk about your marriage and what happened? We met on, we met on Match.com in uh, 2004. I'd just broken up with a long-term eight-year relationship. We were still living together in the same house, but it wasn't a sexually fulfilling relationship. We'd become roommates, really. My husband was Wisconsin Synod Lutheran by upbringing. That's extremely conservative. He was of um, German-Polish descent on both his father's and his mother's side. He'd rec recently discovered a gay Pentecostal group, which he'd attended a little bit. He was a professional ballet dancer, also singer, very gifted artistically. I answered his ad on Match.com because he spoke about his Christian testimony, and he was the only person that I'd seen that did that, so I really responded to say, I appreciate you putting it out there, because I hadn't put mine out there. And he responded, well, you're the only person that answered. <laughs> and so I was on a month's sabbatical, so we chatted for a bit on the phone, and we got to know each other. and. Um, Realized there was potentially some mileage here. But like I said earlier, I insisted that we both be tested because, you know, I, I'd played around. And he said, you know, not a problem. I only had one relationship, been in a monogamous relationship. He got tested and he was HIV positive. Devastated, absolutely devastated. Um, and said, you know, we need to end this relationship now. And I said, hell no, this is where it begins. Because at least, though I was not positive, I'd worked closely with the HIV community over so many years, at least I could help him through this. It was a great relationship. I think I was too much in love with ministry. We'd both planned to move to Canada after my... I had a church in South Florida, which is really where our relationship came into its own. But he had got children in Canada, and MCC had encouraged me to go and work with the church in Canada. So we decided to move to Canada. I went ahead, started the job, and Canadian immigration wouldn't allow him in because of his HIV status, and subsequently wouldn't allow me to get permanent residency because we were legally married. We we'd legally married in Canada the year before, in Montreal. But I was on a six-year contract, and I think that was the beginning of it falling apart. We had a great vacation. I mentioned earlier, you know, we traveled a lot on vacation. We spent a lot of time in the Caribbean. But somehow, I didn't give to it what it really needed. And three years ago now, he'd met somebody who was HIV positive and um, said he needed, our relationship wasn't giving him what he really needed. He needed somebody who was, well, HIV positive, I think. And so, to my shock, he ended the relationship. I had no expectation of our marriage ending. I think I thought I might have done it, but I, we, we, at our ceremony, we always said we would not put any other relationship before the relationship that we now affirm. And, you know, I played around, I confess that, after he was re refused entry to Canada. That was a very lonely experience for me. But I never put myself in a position that would threaten our relationship. So I thought, and I just had this idea, I would move back to south, to the southern states, we would rework on our relationship, and I'd be living in happy retirement in Florida for the rest of my days. But I was too late. I was too late. And um, while I'm very angry that he ended it, I accept responsibility. It was my fault. I didn't give enough commitment to the relationship that I might have done. Thank you so much for being so honest. And I think it's refreshing to see when a relationship goes to end, it's ending or ended that a person is talking about their own responsibility 
that they have in this you know it's easy to be angry with the other person but it's so hard sometimes to take responsibility and it's hard to see responsibility i mean i am in a relationship and i know how sometimes it's easier to think it's the other person <laughs> not me so uh thank you for for sharing this i mean it's it's really valuable for me and reminding me how important it is to look at myself and see my responsibility in things that happen because the relationship is often two ways so thank thank you so much looking back at all of your life not just your relationship but your life until now what do you wish you had done differently if there is something i always say i have no regrets and by that i mean i always accepted the challenge and in the moment did the best that i could now i think the last three years has been very difficult i mean but it's, it's, it's a, not just a relationship ending i took an appointment in a church that was very difficult and the combination of those two things cause health difficulties so I regret that the last three years caused, caused my ministry to end abruptly. But in some ways, they were the best three years of my life because they pushed me really to the edge of my boundaries. You know, it's easy to discern God's will from a comfortable house when you have an income, when everything in your world is going pretty well, when you're sort of semi celebrity but when you're when you're in a position where you have to take low income housing because the church can't afford to pay you properly where you, when you're in a church that you really don't fit but you're sent there because they think you have the best skills to sort it out it really pushes you to the edge but in many ways you know that's what ministry really is it's not about you know, hanging out with lots of lovely people and preaching nice sermons. It's about, you know, going where it's really hard. But I don't regret it. I, I actually like what you said. Like, you did, you see, you look back and you know that you did the best that you could at the time. And that's, I think that's so important to see that we are trying to do our best every day and you know looking back and regretting things or wishing we did them differently at the end we don't really know what would have happened if we made a different decision it's only it's all in our our heads and just trust that we really did uh, our best at that point so i really i love i love your answer it, i i think i see a lot of wisdom within your answer and uh, it's very inspiring to hear your optimism and your positive look on what happened and what is happening especially what you mentioned the last three years which were really hard for you so what is ahead of you what are you hoping for dreaming uh wanting or maybe even planning uh in the future um coming back to the uk has been equally hard i think i had some nostalgic dream that i was going to come back and with all this wisdom and pick up where i left off well you know how naive could i have been Everybody that I knew is either dead or old, like me. Certainly in MCC, hardly anybody knew who I was. And at the forum, it was like, I loved coming back to the forum the last four or five years. But it's like, well, I'm the old man of the forum. I don't want to be the old man of anything. I want to be involved in something that I can contribute to, that I can make a difference to. I've been so disappointed in the church in England, you know, it really hasn't changed in all the years I've been away. And I've been to one or two affirming groups or support support groups rather than affirming. And I'm saying, but they're doing things that we were doing 40 years ago. 
not only haven't things changed, I think they may have even gone backwards because there is no tangible queer community anymore. I think back in the 80s and the 90s, the LGBT community was so important as in my life. You know, without it, I would have died, certainly spiritually and emotionally. But I don't find that. Certainly where I live in Derby, it's hard to find. Um, so I'm working with a tiny Anglican church and helping them in their journey to be inclusive. Um, strangely, this week, after lots of hand-wringing, um, what to do, I've joined One Body, One Faith, which is the reincarnation of LGCM that I was involved in for 25 years, thinking, well, maybe I can do something there. The big problem is I don't have any money. You know, before it was all, I was on a reasonable salary and most of the activism was financed by the groups I was working with. And so now I really have to restrain myself about what I do. I'm doing some online work in, Co in Colombia, which started out as a very personal social thing, but has developed into, I don't like to say it, but almost a pastoral thing. I'm really engaging with a family in Colombia and supporting them through one of their challenges. And, and in particular, helping somebody who's very poor but very talented to go through the coming out process. And that gives me, that almost gives me a family again. Um, so I'm excited about the, but I live in the reality. I may never meet them in person. So it's purely a virtual connection. The activist in me isn't dead, but I want to get involved in something that I can contribute to. I love being part of Rainbow Pilgrims of Faith in September, but I wish I'd have done more. But because I didn't know what I was coming to, I said, well, I'll just, you know, do the hospitality and help at the safe haven. On reflection, I felt, you know, I could have, or could I have given much more? Or maybe I just did what I was supposed to do. So I'm in this little quandary. I have all this experience and don't quite know what to do with it. I'm left in this void where people don't even remember who I am. <laughs> That's one of the challenges of coming out very early. I mean, I was, I came out when I was in my early 20s. I mean, I was 27 when I went to my first European forum. I'm still around 40 years later. And that's a very long time to be involved in gay activism. And I probably have another 10 years. And I'm afraid if I don't do something like that, I'm going to just be part of this senior community in Derby, stay in my apartment and not interact with people. And uh, and that's what will kill me. I don't like to use the word discerning because I've used it way too many times in my life. But I'm exploring the future. But I'm not disliking where I am in life. Not having to go to church every Sunday. Not having to preach every Sunday. There's a liberate, liberation in that. Not having to have a textbook theology you know i think i'm an agnostic right now i would never have said that before because i wouldn't dare you know but i think you know i i really embrace the teachings of jesus and i love the journey that i've been on the journey of faith that i've been on but how much of it now that i'm not working for jesus <laughs> do i embrace i don't know so being, an ag being agnostic gives me a platform to relearn and revisit and re-explore. So that's really where I am. I don't know. Tomorrow could change things drastically. I've, I've connected with a few friends from long ago who have always been important. And at the time of their lives, rekindling that friendship is important to them and me. I have some sense of family. I, it, it's this strange thing of going from almost celebrity status back to a place where nobody knows who you are. Working through that is both the challenge and the adventure, I think. Thank you so much, Paul, for being my guest today. Thank you for being so all open 
and honest and vulnerable about your life, your life story. Thank you, dear viewers and listeners, for being with us today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did listening to Paul's story. This podcast is made uh, in partnership with the European Forum of LGBT Christian Groups. Please subscribe, like, share with others. And if you want to, and if you can, please support this podcast to help it continue. So everything that's left to say is see you next time. And until then, uh, bye everyone and bye, Paul. Bye, thanks very much.